Today, we're going to focus on how to classify matter. Our learning targets include being able to distinguish between pure substances and mixtures, and then how to further classify pure substances as either elements or compounds, and also to distinguish mixtures as either heterogeneous or homogeneous. We will also be examining pictures or particle diagrams and formulas to determine how best to classify them. Matter is important to understand because it is the fundamental basis of chemistry. Chemistry is a study of the composition, structure, and transformation of matter. For today, we're going to focus specifically on the composition and the structure of matter. Let's begin by examining the contents of these pieces of glassware. Let's begin our investigation of matter by examining the contents of this glassware. Take a moment to think about possibilities of what may be in these containers. Pause the video and reflect. Did you think that some of these clear colorless liquids may be water? Did you also guess that they could very well be some sort of acid or base? Maybe you thought it was hydrogen peroxide that was in these containers or a type of alcohol. In all of these cases, you could be correct or you could be completely wrong. The fact of the matter is that simply by looking at a picture, we can't definitively say what, what the contents of these containers are. Here we have a table of some of the possibilities of what could be in those containers. So on the left-hand side, you can see different substances written out, water, acids, um, salt water, sugar water, uh, types of alcohols, even sodium hydroxide is listed and hydrogen peroxide. So think about what they all have in common. Hopefully you recognize that they all appear at room temperature as clear colorless liquids. Um, if you look at the formulas on the right hand side, take a look at what these formulas have in common. Maybe you notice that many of them have the element H or hydrogen. Also, a lot of them include oxygen and carbon. Some also include sodium, which happens to be a metal. There's one here that includes chlorine. So there is some variation amongst the elements that make up each of these types of matter. Notice here that there's a plus sign in the middle of the salt water. What do you think that represents? Think about that as we move forward into our investigation of matter. This is a periodic table that was released in December of 2018 by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. The periodic table is one way that we use to classify matter. It specifically has all of the elements that we know of that exist in our world. The periodic table can be further classified um, by the states of matter that exist at room temperature. So if you look at all the yellow blocks on the periodic table, that color represents the solid phase. So at room temperature, all of the yellow blocks of elements exist at, in the solid phase. At room temperature, mercury and bromine are the only elements on the periodic table that appear as liquids. And then all the elements that are in green appear as gases at room temperature. So this is one way that we can use to classify elements. This slide shows states of matter depicted at the atomic level. 
So here you can see that the atoms of the solid are slightly vibrating. Here in, in the liquid state of matter, you can see that there's less room between the atoms. And then finally in the gaseous phase, you can see um, the high energy, the high kinetic energy that the atoms have and um, the distance between the atoms is much greater. So this is one way to classify matter based on its state. Another version of this periodic table um, shows us classification by region of the element. So you can see the color coding here shows you the difference between metal, metalloids, and nonmetals. This figure simply shows the symbol, the atomic number, and the atomic mass um, that show up in each of the element blocks. We're gonna focus on the mass for our purposes today. Mass is important because in order for anything to be defined as matter, it must have a definite mass and take up space or have volume. Uh, matter can be further categorized as a pure substance or mixture. So let's take a look first at the pure substance uh, section of this flowchart. We'll start by looking at elements. Elements can exist in nature as monatomic or diatomic. So take a look at the difference in the pictures and also the prefixes in these words and make sure you understand the difference. Hopefully you see that the diatomic, the di in, uh, the di prefix and diatomic indicates the presence of two atoms chemically bonded together versus in the monoatomic picture, there's only uh, one atom, no chemical bond here. In the picture on the right with the green uh, elements, the chemical bond is indicated by the overlapping of the shapes. So usually in pictures, that's one way to tell if elements are chemically combined or not. So an element is also defined as a pure substance that cannot be broken down any further by a chemical reaction. And most of the elements on the periodic table exist as monatomic elements. So some examples are neon, copper, lead, and tin. So neon happens to be a noble gas. It was one of the elements that appeared on an earlier slide in green, uh, meaning that it was a gas at room temperature. So the Atomic view here on, in purple with the purple circles shows you uh, how neon may be depicted in a picture because the atoms are spread apart. Uh, down below, we've got copper, lead, and tin. Hopefully you recognize them as metals um, and they are appear as solids at room temperature. So a picture like the one to the left of it uh, with the red circles may be indicative of solid atoms because of the um, very little space between each of the atoms. Now, for diatomic elements, there are seven that of them that exist in nature uh, as two atoms chemically bonded. So here they are, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. In this periodic table, they are color-coded in yellow. So notice um, that there are seven, okay? So if you go over to atomic number seven, nitrogen, Notice what number I'm tracing with my laser pointer. Hopefully you can see that it is the number seven. This is one little memory trick you can use to help you remember the location of the diatomic elements on the periodic table. Just don't forget about hydrogen because that's the seventh one. Another memory trick you can use is the name Dr. Brinkelhoff. So the intention behind the name was to put all of the letters, the symbols of the diatomic elements together in uh, a word that you could pronounce. So again, once again, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. These are just two memory tricks of the many that are out there to help you remember the um, identity of the elements that are classified as diatomic elements and also their location on the periodic table. Now let's take a look at compounds and see if you can distinguish why a picture like this would be classified as a compound versus an element. Take a moment to ponder that. Pause the video. Hopefully you can see that there is a slight overlap of um, 
the circles here, but not only that, more importantly, that the red circle is distinctly different from the white circle, not only in color, but also in size. That is representative of the fact that they are two uh, different pure substances. The fact that they're chemically bonded allows them to continue to fall under the category of pure substance. So for a substance to be classified as a compound, there must be two different elements present and chemically bonded. So if you take a look at the pictures to the right of this slide, you can see um, the not only the red and the white overlapping circles, but Further over, you have C6H12O6, identified for you as glucose. So hopefully you might remember that from a biology class. Um, and then I want you to take a moment and see if you can figure out which of these shapes, which of these colored circles um, best would represent hydrogen in this picture. So pause the video and think about that. Hopefully you guessed that the white circles represent the hydrogen atoms. And the reason for that is the fact that there are 12 hydrogens present in this formula. If you count up all the white circles present in this picture, you will notice that there are 12 of them. If we go back to the first picture on the left, let's think about the identity, um, the possible identity of this molecule. You may recognize this is a familiar structure that's often encountered. Um, it is usually the way that we depict water. So in water, the formula for water is H2O. So the red uh, commonly represents oxygen, the larger atom of the two. And then you've got two hydrogens attached. This uh, structure, this shape is often used to depict water. Not always, um, this may not always be water, but uh, traditionally this is what you will probably encounter. Okay, down below you have two more atoms chemically combined through this line that connects them. So, so you will also notice a difference in size and color um, to indicate the difference in elements. Okay, um, another thing I'm going to point out is that sometimes you may see a line connecting two atoms that represents a bond, and sometimes you might just see an overlapping of circles. But understand that both of these indicate the presence of a chemical bond. Another characteristic of compounds is that their properties, both chemical and physical, uh, can differ from their element components. So let's take a look at this uh, substance down below, these two elements, iron and sulfur. So starting with iron, iron is presented here as a black or dark gray powder. It happens to be magnetic. That's one of the physical properties of iron. Sulfur is over here, uh, a non-metal. It's a yellow, brittle substance, and it also happens to be ground up into a, a powder. It's a, a dull nonmetal. They have very different properties, these two elements. Once they're chemically combined, one possibility is that they can form pyrite, commonly known as fool's gold, and here's the chemical formula for that. So you can see that um, because they are together in a chemical formula, that is how we would depict a compound when writing it out. Um, you can also see that the physical characteristics of pyrite are very different from the element components that make, make it up. Um, pyrite also happens to be non-magnetic. So when, upon chemically combining with sulfur, iron loses that magnetic ability or property. Okay, so now let's think about a molecule. So I bring this up now because it is a phrase or a term rather that you may hear me use quite often. And I want to make sure you're clear on the distinction between an element, a molecule and a compound, and also the similarities between an element, a molecule and a molecule and a compound. So taking a look at the definition, um, molecules are also considered pure substances. Their atoms can be the same or different. So unlike a compound, which you must have different elements for it to be classified as a compound, two or more, molecules can have the same elements. 
the key is that there have to be two of them present. That's what distinguishes it from an element. You can't have a monoatomic molecule. You've got to have two or more atoms present. Okay, so all of these pictures that we looked at up here at the top, on the top, right, all three of them could be classified as molecules because of the identities of the elements that make them up. So if we said that the first picture on the left here was water, H2O, we know those are nonmetals, so easily we can call this a molecule, as well as a compound. On the right, C6, H12O6, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all of those are also nonmetals, so glucose could also be classified as a molecule as well as a compound. Down here at the bottom, I've identified the green circle as chlorine and the white circle as hydrogen. Both of these also happen to be nonmetals, so you could also classify HCl as a molecule as well as a compound. Now, this extra picture here, you might recognize that from a previous slide as the picture used to represent diatomic elements. So remember, um, diatomic elements, you've got two of them, and that's all you need to classify something as a molecule. Two or more same nonmetals. That's good enough to classify the diatomic elements, all of them as molecules. So just understand that diatomic molecule, diatomic element, that's the same thing. It may be used interchangeably. Down at the bottom here, we've got iron. Um, the fact that iron is a metal immediately disqualifies pyrite from being a molecule. Just the presence of a metal is enough to determine for us definitively that iron sulfide is not a molecule, just a compound. Um, also similar to compounds, uh, properties of molecules are different uh, from the, their elemental components. Let's take water, for example. Water is comprised of hydrogen and oxygen gas. At room temperature, they exist as flammable gases, but when combined chemically, they end up being liquid at room temperature and a liquid that also happens to extinguish flames. So their chemical properties, as well as physical, change drastically. Now let's take a look at mixtures. Mixtures are when you have two or more pure substances, so any of these, two or more different ones, put together and not chemically combined. So you could have you could have two compounds chemically combined, two different ones, and call it a mixture. You could have um, three different elements and mix with three different compounds and call it a mixture. Um, the ratios don't matter either. It could still be a mixture as long as you have two or more different pure substances uh, physically mixed and not chemically combined. So a mixture can be further classified as homogeneous or heterogeneous. So homogeneous or homogeneous shows um, is shown in this picture down below here. And in this picture, you can see purple circles. Hopefully you are able to identify the purple circles as an element, a monatomic element. And then secondly, you have these red circles attached to or overlapping the lighter blue circles. Hopefully you can see that that is clearly a compound because the blue is distinctly different from the red. Um, so that would be that could be classified as a compound. So you've got a mixture here of an element and a compound. And the fact that there are distinct levels of separation, distinct layers of separation, the fact that they seem uniformly distributed in this picture um, allows them to be classified, allows this picture to be classified as a homogeneous uh, mixture. So a mixture is when you have two or more pure substances that retain their chemical properties. Because they're not chemically combined, uh, their properties do not change. And they can also be physically separated. So let's take a look at another picture. On the left here, we've got two different types of substances. So we've got two red overlapping circles and we've got um, white uh, connected circles here overlapping. Um, so take a moment, pause the video and reflect on what the identity of these elements could be. Hopefully you're understanding that the red and the white in this picture are probably diatomic elements or diatomic molecules. 
So any, any variation of the seven elements introduces diatomic would be possible. Oxygen for the red, hydrogen for the white. Um, you could also say that the elements could possibly be nitrogen or fluorine or chlorine. So any, and because they're gases, and if this is room temperature, I would probably just add nitrogen into that mix and um, those are our possibilities for what those elements could be, okay? The fact that they're spread throughout the picture and appear evenly mixed, that the, sub, the fact that the substances appear uniform um, indicates that they are homogeneously mixed. And another word, another term to describe this mixture is solution. So that term is often used synonymously with homogeneous mixtures. Now you can have uh, different types of homogeneous mixtures, different phases. So there are gaseous homogeneous mixtures. So the air around us, the air in front of you, behind you, to the right of you, to the left of you, hopefully all that air looks the same. Take a look. Okay. If you're in an unpolluted environment, the air around you should be a homogeneous mixture. Okay, when we say pure air or clean air, sometimes that um, that's a misconception because people in their minds may translate it, translate that phrase into thinking that air is a pure uh, substance when in fact it is a is just, it's 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 a mixture of many gases. Um, so in the air, think about what's in the air. We've got nitrogen, we've got oxygen, we've got carbon dioxide. Um, there's probably a little bit of carbon monoxide in our air. There's definitely it's probably some helium, some hydrogen in the upper layers of our atmosphere because they're so that those gases are so lightweight. Um, if you have jewelry, silver jewelry around, or um, any silver that's in your cabinets at home maybe you notice that a, over time a tarnish develops on the silver and that is a reaction to the hydrogen sulfide gas that's present in the air. Um, so there's a lot of different gases in the air that are all evenly mixed together. Another example of a homogeneous mixture in the liquid phase, um, dishwashing liquid. So notice at the top of the dishwashing liquid, it all looks the same up here um, as it does at the bottom. There is no distinct layer of separation because of the uniform distribution of the molecules making up the liquid here. We can call um, the substance a homogeneous mixture or a solution. Finally, uh, we also have solid solutions. Alloys, metal alloys are considered uh, homogeneously mixed, brass being an example. So brass is actually a mixture of zinc and copper, two metals that are melted together um, Chemi not chemically combined, uh, but physically. So melting together of the zinc and copper um, allows them to mix. And um, the fact that you can melt them to separate them, again, al allows them to be classified as mixtures. If you were to take this brass bell and examine it um, with, from top to bottom, you would probably notice that it's the same color that appears, th that appears the same color and texture throughout, and that allows you to understand that it's evenly mixed. Some other examples of alloys, common alloys are steel and, and bronze. Let's take a look at the heterogeneous mixture. Um, down below, you'll see that the purple atoms or the purple elements have settled to the bottom of the picture here. And that's probably because the atoms that make up this element are more dense than the molecules that are hovering above in this phase. So this is the molecular view of uh, the heterogeneous mixture. When comparing heterogeneous to homogeneous, Heterogeneous mixtures have a non-uniform or uneven distribution of molecules. You can see distinctly parts of the mixture at the microscopic or molecular level as well as the big, in, in the bigger picture. So let's take a look at some, some examples of heterogeneous mixtures. So our gaseous uh, solvent here being the air, 
um, has pollutants visible in it. So these, um, the fact that you can see smog sort of hovering above the city here indicates the presence of solid, small solid particles um, suspended in the air here. Those pollutants are showing that at this time, air is the air here is considered a homogeneous mixture. Another example is uh, salad dressing. So generally when you make um, salad dressing, an oil and oil, uh, a vinaigrette, for example, the oil layer, uh, let being less dense, will float to the top, and the balsamic vinegar, the more dense layer, will sink to the bottom. If you're an avid salad uh, consumer, you would know to mix the salad dressing by shaking the bottle, so that um, it appears more, everything appears more evenly distributed, all the molecules are more evenly distributed before pouring it into your salad. Over time, though after letting the bottle sit or be at rest. Eventually, the more dense vinegar would settle to the bottom of the container and the less dense uh, oil would float to the top, uh, causing that distinct visible separation, allowing you to classify this as a heterogeneous mixture. Finally, we have granite. So we have uh, this rock here and at the top of the rock, you can see there's a little bit more shading of brown or this pinkish color. And if you go to the bottom, you can see distinct uh, differences in uh, color. So you've got the white, more white, more gray appearing at the bottom. So the distinct differences in color in the granite are um, obvious uh, pieces of evidence showing you that this can be qualified as a heterogeneous mixture. We can look a little bit more deeply at heterogeneous mixtures by examining uh, colloids and suspensions. So colloids are um, when you have particles in your mixture that are larger than particles present in a homogeneous mixture or solution, but smaller, um, small enough so that they remain suspended within the solvent. So for example, if you look at this picture of uh, milk at the microscopic level, you can see the globules of fat that are suspended in the solvent. Uh, colloid particles are generally between 5 and 1,000 nanometers. Um, that's small enough for them to remain suspended in solution without sinking to the bottom, without settling to the bottom. So technically speaking, a colloid is an intermediate between a homogeneous mixture and a heterogeneous mixture, um, but for our purposes, we're going to go ahead and classify it as a heterogeneous mixture. Um, another uh, type of heterogeneous mixture we're going to look at is a suspension. So a suspension, the particles are bigger than those in a colloid, so those particles as a result ultimately settle to the bottom of the container. An example um, is paint. When you stir paint, uh, that allows it to be evenly distributed onto your canvas. If you let it sit for some time, you'll notice that um, if you try to paint again later without stirring, that your the paint that appears on your canvas may appear more watery, less um, less pigment will will show up. Uh, if you are if you like hot cocoa or hot chocolate, um, that's another thing that uh, because of the density of the chocolate or um, the chocolate will collect at the bottom of your container. Um, so frequently you may have to stir the hot chocolate so that um, the mixture seems more evenly distributed when you consume it. We're going to look at colloids a little bit more uh, here. So Colloids, their particles do not settle when the stirring stopped. As we mentioned in the previous, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the particles are small enough to remain suspended in the solvent. So another example of a colloid would be smoke. So when you see air pollution, for example, um, those are solid particles that are uh, floating around in the gas solvent. Another example of um, a colloid is fog. So when there is a lot of moisture in the air, the um, you can tell that it is a colloid because um, the Tyndall effect can be observed. So this happens frequently on um, cooler mornings when 
the sun is coming up, you might you may see rays of sunlight uh, peeking through the trees, and it all looks very beautiful. Um, but what's happening, in fact, is that the particles, the heavier particles in the air, the bigger particles in the air, are um, being are interfering with the the light beam, allowing the light beam to become visible. So. This is how the Tyndall effect can be demonstrated. Um, if you have a flashlight or some kind of laser beam pointer um, aimed through a beaker of a solution of a substance of a mixture that's considered evenly mixed um, with small particles in it, uh, you'll notice that the beam of light does not appear in the beaker. However, it does appear in the colloid and it does appear in the suspension, the beam of light appears. Um, and the reason for that is because the colloid particles and the particles in a suspension are larger. They're large enough to cause the beam of light to scatter. So that's one way that you can detect the difference between a mixture that may not be so obvious to discern right away um, by using the Tyndall effect. Let's take another look at this animation of the Tyndall effect to further understand how the scattering of light occurs. So in the beaker on the left, we've got water, plain water, H2O. And the beaker on the right contains diluted milk. So it's basically just milk mixed with a little bit of water. Let's see what happens when we aim a laser beam through each of the beakers. The beaker of water, just plain H2O, has molecules so small that they don't disrupt uh, the pattern, the path of the light. So there's no Tyndall effect exhibited. When the beam is shown through the diluted milk with the colloid, the larger particles, um, the beam is interrupted cause, and the light is scattered. So the butter fat, the water, the carbohydrates, the minerals, the proteins, those larger molecules, uh, also called colloids, um, the fact that they interrupt the distribution of light causing it to scatter, that is what's known as the Tyndall effect. And that is one way to determine the difference visibly between a homogeneous mixture, um, or in this case, a pure substance versus a uh, colloid or heterogeneous mixture.